This is Dr. Lewis. Catch my show, The Dr. Fred Lewis Show, every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. You'll be able to hear news and views, and we want to hear from you. Log in on Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in. Good morning. Today we have with us Judge Martin Hoffman of the 68th District Court in Dallas, Texas. He is here. Judge, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I, I really don't know. Um, that means everybody's got to come back to work, right? Well, we have been working. It's just been remote. So, the, uh, you know, when the coronavirus hit uh, back in last March, it seems like forever at this point, uh, we had to do something. And so we... Uh, uh, pretty much shut in-person hearings down and, and trials in uh, the George Allen Courthouse here in Dallas County. Uh, but we continued to do hearings and uh, bench trials where there wasn't a jury uh, pretty much continuously since uh, the coronavirus hit. So we have been doing court activities, just the courthouse has been, uh, it's been hard to get into the courthouse. We haven't had a whole lot of in-person hearings and we haven't had uh, in-person jury trials and uh, we're starting up in-person jury trials on June 7th. And so uh, this is a big, uh, a big change. And uh, it's going to be good to get people back in the courthouse to get the wheels of justice uh, fully turning. They've been turning as much as we could, but now they're going to be fully turning again on June 7th. Is there a large uh, backlog? Uh... Yeah, there's a massive backlog. Uh, typically in Dallas County, we would try, uh, I'll just say my court, we try 30 to 35 cases a year, jury trials. Uh, and uh, since the coronavirus hit, I, I've done one jury trial. I would, uh, Nathan watched it. We might talk about that a little bit on, on Zoom, uh, which, uh, you know, had its pluses and minuses. Uh, but um, we're going to be back. Uh, the, the backlog is significant very, very significant, but we're going to try to start digging out as quickly as we can because we need to keep that wheels of justice moving. Good. Speaking uh, of uh, Nathan, we have Nathan Williamson. Uh, he's a trial lawyer, and uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Tell me what you like about being a trial lawyer. Uh, I, I love helping clients, helping people get justice. Uh, you know, I think that one of the best feelings in the world is to take someone who's been harmed by the negligence of someone else and getting them justice. So that's that's what I do, that's what I love to do, and that's what I've been doing for uh, nine years now. Oh, great. He's, a, he, he's young. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Compared boy. to us, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I'll tell you something. Uh, let's talk just a little bit about the American uh, jurisprudence, you know. Uh, trial by jury. Uh, it's in the Constitution. Uh, I think we're still going by that, right? Yeah. We are. We are. The One of the things, I don't know if the viewers can see this, I have a little seven on my lapel. People always ask me, what does that mean? What is the seven? Uh, the seventh is the Seventh Amendment, and that's the right to a civil jury trial, something that has been under assault a lot from the uh, legislature and, and other forces that don't want people to have the right to a trial by jury. And this coronavirus has been a, a real uh, struggle for a lot mm -hmm. of jurisdictions all over the country. Uh, but it's a fundamental right. Uh, when somebody takes away your right to trial by jury, it's like taking away any other constitutional right. And I think uh, as judges and attorneys and, and people, uh, we need to always uh, strive to defend it. People think about the right to a trial by jury in criminal cases, uh, and that's very important too. But it's just as important, I'd love to get Nathan's thought on this, uh, to have a right to a trial by jury in a civil case as well. Yeah, I think it's definitely imperative to have that, that right to uh, trial by jury, civil jury trials, and the Seventh Amendment. I, I, I feel remiss that I forgot my Seventh Amendment. <laughs> uh, and I'm an active member of the Texas Trial Lawyers Association and the Dallas Trial Lawyers Association. And as Judge Hoffman said, our, our right to trial by jury is under constant attack. Mm -hmm. uh, even this legislative session, there are so many different laws and things that they're doing to slowly chip away at uh, individuals' rights to trial by jury. Why do they and do that? I, I think that, you know, I, I would love to really get to the bottom of it, but I think that there's this misconception that there is this uh, prevalence of fraudulent trials, that there's this over um, overuse of the court system, and that's just not true. If you really look at the numbers, the, jury tr the, the number of jury trials has consistently went down. The problem is that 
our uh, I think our country and our system sometimes sides more with the corporate side of things instead of the individuals because the individuals are the ones who are guaranteed that right by our constitution to a trial by a jury and a trial by their peers and every legislative session almost every day you hear something else about these evils of these trial lawyers or these trials and I think that it's just um, really misplaced and just a way to kind of create a, a boogeyman in a sense to take away people's rights and I, I think that that's just uh, horrible and shameful that we continue to have to deal with that. I remember 25 years ago, uh, you were with Wendell Turley's firm, I believe. That's right. That's and uh, that long was ago. one of the premier firms. And uh, if I recall correctly, the uh, fairness was an issue with you as why you decided to become a judge. That's absolutely true. Uh, that, that's a great memory. I was uh, with Wendell Turley. He's a real institution here. Uh, in the Dallas legal community. He's still around. He still has his building. He, he still has his law firm, and he's still uh, practicing with his daughter and family wow. and other, other attorneys as well. He does a, a wonderful job still. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I went into the practice of law with the idea that I wanted to help people, mm -hmm. and uh, so I did a very similar area of law that Nathan does now. I, was a, I did personal injury, and I represented people, and uh, and I saw in our court system uh, that uh, there was not always a, a even playing field for the corporate interest and the individual interest. And I really felt that it was important that everybody had a fair shot. Everybody mm -hmm. uh, let the chips fall where they may. If we have some cases have strong merit, some cases don't have a strong merit, but everybody should get a fair shot. Uh, and so I made the decision back in 2006. Uh, it was a tough decision. Uh, to run for judge, uh, but uh, I, I will tell you every day I love the job and every day I try to bring fairness and provide an even play field to both sides and, and hopefully treat everybody with respect. Mm -hmm. One other thing when it uh, came down to fairness, uh, I believe it was in 08 or after the economic downturn, uh, you were one of the prime movers as to dealing with uh, fairness and foreclosures. You want to share that with us? Yeah, you got you got to get me on my soapbox a little bit here because uh, it's something I'm really passionate about. So I was elected back in 2006, and as a, as a new judge, I uh, noticed that we were having these foreclosures that were filed, and the foreclosures, uh, that people weren't responding to these foreclosure applications. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very strange. I'm like, if I was being foreclosed on, I would respond at least and see if I could do something to save my home. And so I would talk to the bank's attorneys and say, hey, why Why does nobody ever respond to these? And they said, oh, judge, don't worry about it. Just sign it. It's no big deal. These people are deadbeats or they abandoned the property and you don't need to worry about it. And I said, well, I don't feel comfortable with this because I'm not hearing from the homeowners. And so uh, I started doing some research into the law about uh, foreclosures and how it come about because I'd never done I was kind of did the same thing that Nathan does now. I never dealt with foreclosures and so I started looking into it and it turns out that the rules regarding foreclosures and how they were handled was totally different than any other civil case. Uh, and the example I give is that uh, let's say that you had somebody and they were rear-ended in a car accident or a, a victim of uh, you know, medical malpractice or whatever, the defendant in the case would be entitled to personal service. They'd be entitled to have somebody come up and hand them a lawsuit and tell them you are sued. So they knew that they were sued. And the law back then, the law has changed a little bit since then, the law back then was you didn't have to do that in foreclosure cases. So the individuals who were going through foreclosures had less rights than a drunk driver that paralyzed a child or a negligent doctor or, or anyone else or a corporation that had, had injured somebody uh, because you didn't, it wasn't required to personally serve them. All it was required was to send them a letter. And, uh, you know, I talked to people in the industry and I said, look, a lot of people, if, any, if you've never known anyone who's ever been through this type of uh, situation is they, they get a lot of stuff from attorneys and banks and if they're going through financial difficulties and 
there was a concern was, well, do these people even know they're foreclosed mm -hmm. on? Mm -hmm. So I took what was kind of a radical step at the time, and I said, you know what, I'm going to let everybody who's being foreclosed on have an opportunity to have a hearing in front of me and tell me what's going on in their case, to see if there's any way we can see, save their homes. And the banks were mad. They were like, Judge, you can't do that. That's not right. That's not fair. I said, well, I want to, this, this is going to be a waste of time. You're going to be embarrassed. And I was worried. I mean, I was taking a radical step. And so I decided on my first day, we sent out about 30 notices for the first hearing we ever had. And I was curious to see if anyone was going to show up. Because by this point, we were starting to hit the foreclosure crisis. Mm -hmm. And we were getting a lot more of these applications in. Three quarters of the homeowners who had not responded to the lawsuit showed up at the hearing. And they said, Judge, and I heard this over and over and over again, they said, Judge, why am I here? I'm in the middle of negotiations with the bank. They told me they're going to let me save my house. Why are you foreclosing on my house? And I'm like, and I looked at the bank, I'm like, well, what's going on here? And what was happening again and again and again was that the banks were talking to the homeowners and they were saying, hey, we're going to modify your loan at the same time they were foreclosing. And I realized that we needed to do something. And so uh, I decided in every single case and in every case since then uh, where someone's going through a foreclosure in my court, I've given them the opportunity to have a hearing. Uh, I've given them the opportunity to go through credit counseling. Uh, I've given them the opportunity to go to mediation. Uh, if they want to, and a lot of those people who would have been foreclosed on uh, ended up modifying their loans and keeping their homes. And so, uh, and I will say this, that uh, President Obama saw this problem, I saw it in the trenches, he saw it from the big picture, he passed a rule that made a huge difference that really helped a lot of people, which said that uh, if you're going through bank, if you're going through a loan modification process, you can't go through foreclosure at the same time. You've got to let them finish the modification. And so uh, I will tell you, a lot of the people, even after that rule was enacted, I would bring them in and I'd say, uh, hey, are you going through loan modification right now? And the banks would say, oh, well, this was a mistake. We didn't realize he was going through modification. And they would dismiss the foreclosure. And so uh, it's one of the things, the, the good thing, the interesting thing about this crisis, this COVID crisis, is we haven't seen a whole lot of foreclosures. And I can give you my thoughts about that. But uh, in 2007, 2008, 2009, when we were in the middle of this crisis, uh, we were seeing dozens of cases every month. And that number has dwindled, fortunately. Uh, and so I'm, I'm proud of what we did in the 68th. A lot of other judges around the state kind of adopted this program, uh, and a lot of people's homes got saved. And I, I'm happy that uh, I was able to be a, a part of that. Well, you were a big part of it. I, uh, before I went into the, uh, no, not arbitration. I've been an arbitrator over 40 years. I'm not trying to tell my age, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I went into mediation, uh, I found Time after time after time, you get a mediation order, and then all of a sudden, they started showing up. And I tracked it back. It, actually, I tracked it back to you, and you had a rule where you gave people uh, two years to, to work out a settlement in their cases. Uh, I don't think two years, but yeah. But I, I gave them time to do it. Yeah, it was time. Yeah. And, you and, gave them time to do it. One of the key things I think about mediation, especially in the foreclosure arena, was that uh, when we were going, to, and especially when we were going through the crisis, is that these folks, the the, the people involved in the, with the banks mm -hmm. that were dealing with the uh, with the loans, the loan officers, they would have so many foreclosures that they couldn't focus on just one, and so they would lose uh, foreclosure, they would lose modification packets, they would. Uh, they would get fired and the new person would come in and you'd have to resubmit it and it forced the bank to sit down with the homeowner and say, okay, are you going to modify this loan or are you not going to modify this loan? Is it possible to save this home? And sometimes just the, and I would make them show up in person. I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'd make them show up in person. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you had some bank out in Delaware or Connecticut and they knew they were going to have to come down here. They'd be like, okay. We need to look at this loan so that we we'll see if we can say if we can if this is a loan that we can go ahead and modify. And I think that just the process that they knew that they had to go to mediation and, and 
uh, when they actually got to mediation allowed them to focus on that loan so that homeowner had an opportunity to know if they could save their home or not and it was it was really key the fortunate thing in this particular crisis uh, home values have gone through the roof so if anyone is ever in that situation uh, most people are able to if not save their home they're able to sell their home and get the equity out you never want to go through a foreclosure because you lose so much of your equity yeah. uh, so we don't see as many of these cases fortunately uh, but the next time we have this type of thing come up you know it's gonna we're gonna need a program like this and so I remember there was a case it was a foreclosure I'm not sure what which whether it came from your court or another court uh, it was an old sailor uh, he uh, was discharged in 1951 and he uh, came to the uh, mediation and he had this brown sack you know what was in the brown sack Jeff? forty thousand dollars cash oh my god <laughs> <laughs> okay he says I'm serious you know uh, you know I want to keep my property but the bank won't won't work with me. And the bank officer almost fainted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. There, there were abuses back Oh, then. absolutely. And that was a serious problem. A lot of people who could save their homes were having a lot of problems getting the bank to just, once you got into that process, it was hard to get out of it because the banks sometimes wouldn't even take your check after you were late a couple of times. And so uh, getting them to sit down and, and talk to the other side uh, sometimes allowed resolution to occur and allow mm -hmm. people to save their home. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it's interesting. I don't know about the sailor story, but I could see that. Oh, because yeah. You just probably wanted, hey, look, I've tried to work with the bank. They won't work with me. Yeah. I have the cash. Will you just do this? And I've heard that story many times, yeah. that type of story many yeah. times, but not yeah. a sailor with a sack of cash. And, you know, uh, usually uh, there can be a meeting of the minds. Absolutely. Usually there can be. Uh, of course, you know, trial lawyers like, like you, all you really want is justice for your client. But there was a time when, uh, you know, that was far and few in between. So we have to look at our current situation. Uh, we know that there's uh, going to be a, a, a situation where uh, people could not pay. Uh, we, you know, I don't know, uh, but we have to anticipate that uh, there's going to be a lot of people who have little or no income for a while. You know, uh, I don't know how to how we're going to work those situations out. But uh, how many million people lost their jobs during the last year or so? Yeah, that's a it's, huge yeah, number. it's a huge number, and I know that each month it kind of, you know, the hope is that some of those jobs recover, but unfortunately it hasn't. So there is going to definitely. Uh, be a number of people who do not have income who are going to need uh, assistance and I mean judges like Judge Hoffman I think that sometimes um, you know I think that there's that old saying that all politics is local and your judges your elected officials those individuals are the ones who are on the ground you mm -hmm. know you have those people who see it like you know President Obama did in 08 from that you know uh, higher level but the people who are in the trenches and dealing with it and assisting those individuals are our local uh, elected officials our judges and people who can actually make that difference and you know implementing these policies and seeing the issues uh, and trying to do things to get us back to moving and getting people who you know a lot of those people who you know it, one of the worst things is to talk to a client who's not only lost their job but has also waited another year and a half to see their day in court you know, who has an insurance company or a company on the other side that's telling them that, you know, your pain and suffering, your injuries, what you're dealing with is not worth it. It's not worth anything to us. We're going to offer you zero dollars because our driver rear-ended your vehicle. I think I can guess what company happen. that is. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't put you in good hands, I'll say that. Much. But, uh, you know, and it, it's these things of getting us back to... Uh, moving, getting us back to trying these cases and being proactive with that and doing, you know, whatever is necessary to keep individuals safe, but also uh, getting us back to where they're getting to enjoy all of their uh, rights, including their Seventh Amendment right to trial by jury. Okay. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, I've been outside the United States and I've seen um, 
judicial systems, quote, judicial systems, uh, would not pass muster, period. Uh, what's your name? Okay, you stand over here. And next thing you know, here's my decision. It could be a local magistrate in, you know, foreign country or whatever. No input, no jury. You know, so we must consider ourselves lucky in this, uh, this country. Question, how do you see the future panning out, Judge? Uh, we've got a bunch of young lawyers coming through. Uh, we have uh, some situations that they're going to have to work out, and the judicial system is going to have to answer. Uh, what do you project? What do you think? Well, it's a broad question. So, I know, <laughs> what's the future of the I legal know. system? So, one thing I will say, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pick on a part of this, which is uh, we've learned some things with this pandemic that uh, we didn't really know before. There was. Uh, the pandemic was a horrible experience. It's not over, so we shouldn't. I shouldn't talk about it in the past sense, but uh, that we've learned some things, and and one of the things we've learned is that there are efficiencies that we didn't know that we had. And so, mm -hmm. for example, using remote hearings like Zoom uh, depositions that I'm sure Nathan will talk a little bit about, uh, doing hearings and and uh, different things on Zoom, mediations on Zoom. Uh, there's a, there's efficiencies there that that I never used before. I think most people never really knew about, and so I think young attorneys, uh, people who want to go into the legal profession, I think understanding technology is going to be more important uh, than ever. Uh, and uh, we need to. The, the big fear I have right now is. Uh, will people show up to jury trials? Will we have jurors show up to jury trials? And uh, I will say this, that, that Dallas County is taking every precaution. We're probably far more uh, cautious than most other places in terms of uh, making sure that people are safe. It's gonna be far safer to go to, I think, a courthouse than it is that we go to a grocery store uh, because we're gonna have all sorts of uh, procedures in place to make sure that that we do this as safely as possible with social distancing and things like that. But I understand that there's gonna be people who are very afraid of that. And so in the short run, I want, to, I want people to, to know that, that this is gonna be as safe as possible and that they can return to jury service. And, and uh, when summons, uh, the summons have started going out, they're gonna, they're gonna to continue to go out. Uh, the way we're gonna initially do uh, jury uh, selection is gonna be extremely uh, careful. We're going to have uh, we have a very large central jury room that fits 400 people, uh, and uh, we're going to bring in about 50 to 100 jurors to to be ju selected in the central jury room for jury trials. Uh, so we're going to take every precaution possible. And so uh, that you know, the, in the short run, I think people just need to uh, to the extent they can. Now, if you're a vulnerable population and you haven't been able to get a vaccine for whatever reason, or you know, you're, you're sick and you're, you know, we obviously don't want you to show up to jury service, but if you're healthy and you feel comfortable, whether you've been vaccinated or, uh, and you uh, can come and you've been summoned, we really hope people will show up again because as Nathan said, the system doesn't work without jurors participating. We have to have jurors here. We have to have a jury of your peers. And so we don't want to have this just being, one, we don't want to not be able to do jury trials because jurors don't show up, or two, we don't want to have any population excluded. We want everyone to have a jury truly of their peers, so we want all aspects of Dallas County, all diversity uh, to be on our jury panel. So I really hope your listeners will uh, consider it if they get a jury summons to, to show up and, and, and do their service and, and understand that we as judges will do everything possible to make sure that's a safe experience. Will the uh, people uh, coming for uh, selection to be on a jury, uh, will they have to have proof that they've been vaccinated? No, no they won't. Uh, that's not something that's allowed uh, by our our Supreme Court, uh, but we will be testing them. Uh, at least initially, we're going to be doing taking people's te temperatures. We're going to be having them fill out a questionnaire. So if they're sick, 
uh, they will be sent away. Uh, so we're going to be we're going to make sure everybody wears masks. Uh, even uh, the judges, the jurors, the attorneys, uh, everyone involved will be in masks. Or at certain times, uh, some of the uh, participants will be wearing uh, face shields, but mostly masks. Uh, so we're going to make sure, do everything possible, but uh, we can't. Uh, mandate, uh, well, at least at this point, we can't mandate people be vaccinated. Okay. All right. Well, I tell you, I, uh, for one, I'm glad that uh, the country has made such great progress. Uh, it was a little over 100 years ago that we had a similar situation, and uh, I don't know, I, I don't understand the logic of some People, on one hand, I don't understand them not wanting to wear a mask, but if you go back and research, you, you see uh, in uh, 1918 that people, they had masks on, yep. you know, and it was one of the uh, most common sense things uh, to do. And then if you go back further and look at all the plagues, that, you know, the six or eight historical plagues, they didn't have masks in a nice corporate mm. cut, but they had whatever they could get over their face. But uh, I guess each to his own, but uh, I, I, I think we'll, we'll be okay. I hope so. I, I think we'll be okay. Counselor, uh, a lot of the uh, trial lawyers have a case that they really want to get to trial. Uh, tell us about any examples that you have. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, I, I was saying uh, a little bit earlier, I think before the show, that one of my goals last year was to try a number of cases. And I think that as a trial lawyer, you want to be in trial. That's what we we're, we do. Uh, you want to be able to provide that justice and provide that access to our, our clients. So, you know, I, I can't give you one because there's so many of them that actually <laughs> need to be. You got a load of them. You know, there's been, uh, you know, stated that, you know, we, we're, our system moves based on jury trials. A lot of things happen uh, based on that schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing that you have a trial date coming uh, forward, there's a lot of things that happen. A lot of, uh, you know, hearings on different evidentiary issues. You have your mediations, you have depositions, things like that. Uh, and the pandemic has not only impacted the in courthouse activities, but outside of the courthouse, you know, people were not going to uh, offices and sitting around tables and doing depositions, we started having to transition to doing remote depositions. Um, you know, where we're just sitting on Zoom and, you know, the clients, you know, in a, at their house and I'm at, you know, my house and the defense counsel's at their house and we have a court reporter, you know, somewhere else at their own home. So you now have this uh, different way of having to adapt to doing things. And I think that, you know, it's it was, uh, it was difficult to do at first, but it was something necessary to try to at least keep the, the wheels of justice moving mm -hmm. and keep these cases moving. So when the courts did open back up, you know, we would have cases that are uh, potentially ready to start going to trial. So, you know, I, I, and that question is, as far as one case, I can't tell you just one because I'm already thinking of, you know, my clients who had hoped in 2020 to be able to get their day in court, who are now hoping in 2021 as we start to, uh, get back to actually having jury trials and a lot of the uh, measures that Dallas County has put into place to hopefully keep our clients safe, keep us safe, uh, that will in turn keep our family safe. So I'm excited about it. I know my clients are excited about it and um, hopeful to start trying jury trials after June 7th. Okay. Hmm. One last question here. What made you want to be a lawyer? Uh, that's a, you know, I, when I, I, if you ask most of my family growing up, everyone thought that I would be a preacher, and that's kind of interesting, being that I'm a very quiet person. I don't really, uh, I'm not very vocal, but I think that I saw, you know, an opportunity to help people has always really been something that I wanted to do. After uh, graduating from undergrad, I actually worked for an insurance company for a while, so uh, it's interesting that I come back and I'm on this side, and I think that that impacted me being in a position to see people who have genuinely been injured and then them not, you know, not being able to really help them, you know, having this system to where they're more of a number. We're putting their, you know, I put their injuries into a system and that system tells me how much their injuries worth. And I just didn't like that aspect of things. So I knew that I wanted to, um, to do something. And when I was in law school, I actually met a attorney who was part of the Oklahoma Access to Justice 
the uh, Oklahoma Trial Lawyers Association. And from that moment, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a trial lawyer. I wanted to help individuals who were injured, uh, you know, receive justice. And that's been my motivation ever since. Good, good. Judge, um, share with us some of the uh, horrendous cases that have come where, where it was <laughs> obvious that there was justice. Uh, Horrendous cases. Uh, do you mean like horrendous injuries or horrendous? In, uh, in uh, horrendous injury. Yeah, well, we've had. Uh, you know, in, in in I'm a civil district judge, mm -hmm. and so we handle cases. Uh, one of the things about district court is we can handle every size of case. I've handled cases as small as a, you know even a few hundred dollars in dispute. Well, that's pretty rare. Uh, usually, it's a few thousand dollars in dispute on credit cards or whatever. All the way up to you know multi-billion dollar cases uh, you know the most serious injury case I've ever had involved a group of missionaries whose uh, plane crashed in Guatemala wow. and uh, nine or ten of them passed away a number of them had very serious injuries and uh, having <coughs> to deal with with that was was very challenging because there was uh, some real issues involving the maintenance of that plane and, and other issues and so uh, that was without question the the that the had the most loss of life in in a case but we've had a number of death other types of death cases we had a the saddest case I think ever had involved a, a baby that died at a, uh, a home health care uh, or home uh, home daycare mm -hmm. situation and the baby suffocated and it was it was tragic but you see a lot of really sad cases sometimes uh, that's one of the reasons I like to do, you know, I, I, I know my job is to try to resolve those types of cases and make sure that they have their chance for a day in court, but I'm also human, and so uh, being able to do things like weddings, uh, I do weddings for free, uh, and I've done, you know, over a thousand of them at this point, because uh, I like to bring a little joy, too, into the courthouse when mm -hmm. you have sometimes a lot of sadness, uh, and I like to work with young people. I've had over 300 interns and a way to give back and they always have a lot of enthusiasm so you know you, you have to balance the you know and I'm sure that Nathan is the same way sometimes you see just really tragic things and what you do and so you try to bring joy in in other ways into what can be a, you know a very solemn situation and so uh, but that without question the the the, uh, the the plane crash in Guatemala was the was uh, was the worst that I'd I'd seen in terms of horrendous wow what's the worst you've seen yeah I mean it, you know it is those death cases I've handled cases where you know pedestrians struck by vehicles who uh, unfortunately passed I had a case uh, about a year or two ago of uh, a, a mother well uh, a husband and wife who came to visit their uh, child here in, in the Metroplex and unfortunately while the mother was walking the dog uh, was struck by a vehicle and those are the things that uh, you know, um, are difficult to, to deal with. I think that sometimes uh, in this profession, in this line of work, we do deal with people sometimes at their worst spaces and their worst places mm -hmm. and trying to, um, you know, provide them that support and trying to help them to uh, navigate a system that sometimes cannot be, uh, it's not always intuitive and it's not always kind and sometimes it's, it doesn't seem fair. You know, one of the dif most difficult things that I, I tell people uh, it is to do is to tell someone that a life has a, a monetary value. You know, to tell someone that, you know, no matter what I do, uh, we're never going to be able to bring that individual back. Mm -hmm. You know, all we can do is to, to you know, it, it's what sum of money, if paid today, will, you know, and I'm, I'm messing up the, the, the jury charge here, but, you know, to, to satisfy that, but it, that's the most, that's probably one of the most difficult things that, you know, I do, and it's, it's always difficult, it never gets easy, it never, you know, I, I am a, uh, an emotional person and I attach myself to my clients and to my cases, so, you know, having someone who loses a mother, a wife, a grandmother is very difficult because, you know, that person never sees them, and no matter how much um, money they are able to recover in there, there, there's that loss, and so that's the most difficult thing. Um, you know, seeing the horrific injuries are, are, are terrible as well. Individuals yeah. who, um, you know, 
just from being somewhere end up having this life changing uh, or horrific injury. I mean, those are difficult things, but um, you know, as, as Judge Hoffman says, that there are some times to try to bring some joy or something back to it and give back to those individuals and give back to the community in, in general. So, um, trying to, that's one of the reasons I like to do some other cases other than just personal injury cases, because sometimes you do need that light uh, when sometimes you deal with nothing but the darkness and the, the mm -hmm. uh, people at their worst position sometimes. I, uh, I'll just share with, with you. I've, I saw a case where the uh, defendant corporation was a foreign corporation, and they insisted upon, uh, how would you say, making all decisions. Uh, I won't call the name of the headquarters because we can figure out the manufacturer real quickly. Uh, it was a rear end, uh, doing about 60 miles an hour. The children in the back uh, collided head first with the parents, broken seat belts, you know, you name it. Brain damage uh, from the uh, for the children as well as one of the parents. And to be quite frank uh, with you, that case could have settled for 90 million, 100 million dollars. Oh no, <laughs> have you ever run into a, an unreasonable uh, corporate defendant? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's, that's yeah. the wrong question. <laughs> yeah. I'll let Nathan answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it, that's, that's probably, you know, it's in that same vein and one of the difficult things is you have these defendants sometimes who just don't do what's right. You know, that, that idea that they're just, you know, you're looking at something and you ask yourself, how can you see this any differently? You know, what is, what, what are you seeing that I'm not? What is there some way that you can um, feel that it's okay to act or react in the way that you are? And I mean, it, it's, it's horrible. Uh, that those individuals or those companies, not individuals, because it's typically a company mm -hmm. that acts in that way, that does not have the best interest of the public at heart, but then you'll see these commercials or see these things and they act one way in that sense, but then you're looking at what is the actual way that they are, um, you know, in the day to day and it's, it's, it's shameful and it's sad and it's, you know, the redress is a courthouse. You know, that's where we get our justice. That's where we get our day in court. That's where we have a jury of our peers say whether or not that individual will be held accountable for their actions. So that's what I, I love about our, our judicial system, giving us that option. Um, you know, as, as we said earlier, you know, the unfortunate part about that is that those rights are under attack every day. Mm -hmm. You know, there's laws right now. I, you know, House Bill 19, and I won't get on my soapbox about these different things. <laughs> well, go you know, ahead, get on you your soapbox. That, that are giving these trucking companies an out, you know, giving them ways to um, for a change individuals. You have uh, bills that are attacking people's rights to adequate medical care by limiting the amount of damages that they can present to a jury, limiting the amount that those medical providers can even be compensated for the services that they provide. But at the same time, when those individuals are injured, that injured, the person who caused this incident is not paying those medical bills. Mm -hmm. They're not sending them to a hospital. They're not checking in and asking them, oh, do you need this, do you need that? They're just saying, well, you need to go and get treatment. And if they don't get that treatment, then they say, well, you really must not have been injured. But if you are injured, you get the treatment, then, well, you know what, I don't think that we should have to pay you that amount. You know, I think that we should pay you how much this company pays for the services. and it's. It's sad and it's something that we have to um, always be mindful of and realize that our rights are under attack. Not just the rights that you hear everyone scream about, your you know, right to uh, bear arms or your right to freedom of speech, the First or Second Amendment are the things we focus on. But without your Seventh Amendment, without your right to redress, you take those things away, you don't get to go to court about it. You yeah. don't get to talk to those, about yeah. those things. It's just gone. So we have to realize that there's a lot more that needs to be protected and that we have to be mindful of. Well, I'll tell you, juries have a way of uh, sending messages. Uh, in the case I had mentioned, uh, Frank Branson was the attorney. Uh, I know the corporation we say had settled because the jury said $240 million. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, but that was justice. The, the thing is, um, we still have a system where the ordinary reasonable person who sits on a jury 
is the final arbiter. <laughs> okay. And uh, sometimes that's the only way you get justice. The only way. Uh, the other thing, uh, Judge, you, um, you're a busy fellow in the community, <laughs> okay? You, you, you've served on so many different boards, commissions, and, and things of that nature. How, how do you do it all? I'll say this, you know, it is, uh, being a judge is a blessing, I will say that, and uh, I've been tremendously uh, blessed that the voters of Dallas County have returned me uh, to this office now, this is my fourth term, and I realize that as an elected official, my time is finite here, it's, it's as long as the voters decide to return me, uh, I will continue to serve. But uh, while I'm here, I believe that I, it's my duty to, to do what I can to try to give back. And mm -hmm. so uh, I do everything that I can because I know I'm not going to be here forever. And so uh, whether, you know, I've had over 300 interns that I've helped with, uh, I've done, uh, you know, spoken to countless different organizations and both legal organizations, political organizations, churches real estate groups, all sorts of different things to try to educate the community about uh, things like foreclosure, or the mm -hmm. right to trial by jury, or, or getting involved in the legal system. Uh, I've tried to help uh, young lawyers and educate, or just all lawyers uh, in educational opportunities where I teach or to organize uh, CLEs to help improve their trial skills. And before I was a, a judge, I worked a lot with neighborhood associations in, uh, in advising uh, neighbor associations on how to deal with uh, the city of Dallas, because uh, I was in the city of Dallas, uh, on uh, zoning issues and uh, help train neighborhood leaders on that and give advice and stuff like that. Because we're only here for a limited amount of time and mm -hmm. I'm a believer that, that we need to give back and I always try to teach my interns as well is that look, I'm spending time trying to teach you I hope that you'll go on and, uh, and, and, and help, help in the community. And I'm proud to say that in the last two years, uh, the, we have, there's a group called the Dallas Association of Young Lawyers. Three of the next four presidents of that group are, are former interns of mine. The former president of the J.L. Uh, Turner, which is the African American Bar, is a former intern of mine, and, and two of my former interns are actually running for judge this time, mm. uh, which is really exciting to me that, they, that they are, uh, they've seen that uh, that this is hopefully a worthy calling, and so uh, it, it's a blessing, and it's a blessing I take seriously, and it's something that, that I, I hope to continue a, a while longer uh, so that I can continue to give back. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you, uh, I recognize a lot of these organizations that you've been a part of. Uh, J.L. Turner is the affiliate, the local affiliate of the National Bar, and I was the vice chair for EDR for them for six years. And they want me to come back, but no, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, I, I really don't believe a lot of people um, understand the impact that you and others have had in the community. Uh, when you are, uh, it can just be on a neighborhood uh, board, or it might be uh, on a community center, or anything like that. Uh, a lot of people are influenced by that and your service, giving back, or however you want to phrase it, is uh, greatly uh, influential in the communities. Well, I, you had mentioned J.L. Turner, and, and I wanted to just maybe say a couple words about that. J.L. Turner is the uh, local affiliate of the National Bar Association and uh, the African American Bar here. One of the greatest uh, honors that I've ever received and it was I was really uh, humbled by this was that uh, the J.L. Turner awarded me the uh, Cleophas Steele uh, uh, Committed mm -hmm. Mentor Award. Uh, I was the only non-African American to ever win that award and, and uh, I, I want to believe that's because I really believe in, in not only helping young people but really trying to 
promote diversity within our legal profession because it is something that, that's a serious problem. And so I've had a lot of interns over the years that are African American and other uh, backgrounds. And so uh, that was uh, that was one of the, the, the moments that I really uh, I was kind of shocked and humbled that I got that award. And, and well was deserved. Very I appreciate Definitely that. Definitely well deserved. Well deserved. Well deserved. Gentlemen, uh, when you, I'm going to take you back uh, in a few minutes uh, when we come back after we have uh, a break. Uh, I'm going to take you back in time to some of your days when uh, you were youths and ask you a couple of questions as to. Okay. Okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good morning. Today we have with us Judge Martin Hoffman of the 68th District Court in Dallas, Texas. He is here to announce that the civil district courts in Dallas, Texas will open on June the 7th, 2021. I repeat, the civil district courts in Dallas, Texas will reopen on June the 7th, 2021. As you are quite aware, the court system was shut down due to the coronavirus for over one year. I hope that everything goes well and that justice will be administered as we know it always has. Thank you. When you were young, okay, uh, had you uh, thought about being an attorney when you were young? Let's say 10 years old, somebody asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? That, that's a great question. That's kind of funny. Uh, I... Uh, when I was 10, I actually wanted to be a truck driver. I thought that sounded like a lot of fun. Uh, there was Smokey and the Band and all this. Your younger viewers are not going to remember that show. But mm -hmm. uh, but when I was hit about 12 or 13, I'll be curious to see what Nathan says about this. Uh, as a typical teenager, preteen, I would argue with my mom a lot. And she would say, you should be a lawyer someday. You argue so much. And I started looking into it. I didn't really know. I didn't have any lawyers in my family and wasn't really sure what that meant and started looking at it and I was like, you know what, this is something that was really interesting to me and didn't really realize until I got older kind of all the, I mean, being a lawyer also is a blessing and it's a responsibility that you really have to, to teach people and help people through the, the our, our complicated legal system. And so uh, it was something, uh, it was interesting. I went from wanting to be a truck driver to be, which is a very honored profession, to being a lawyer and I kind of stuck with that. I thought a number of times also my parents are both professors at, at uh, community colleges. I thought about doing that as well. I really like to teach, uh, but ended up going into to law and, and uh, have loved uh, loved every minute, I wouldn't say every minute of it, but mm -hmm. I've loved, really loved the profession and so. Good, good. Counselor, how yeah, about you? I, I would say at 10, I probably, you know, I, <laughs> at 10 years old, I was probably into, like, wrestling. So I probably, if you would ask the 10-year-old <laughs> what I would have said, a professional wrestler, it probably wasn't until I actually, you know, in listening to Judge Hoffman's story, it reminds me of when I think that it kind of started clicking to me that I would be an attorney. It was my uh, senior year of high school. I remember, uh, you know, I, I had a... Um, I had no interest ever of running for any political office or anything, never, you know, president of my class, anything like that. And I remember one day we got a, uh, you know, our little school newspaper came out and it said, hey, congratulations to your new class president and all this stuff. And I was like, well, when did we vote? And so I had like wrote, I penned this whole editorial to the school newspaper about mm -hmm. how they stole our right to vote, that they had this behind the scenes elections and all of this stuff. and you know, this whole long thing. And so I was like, voted most argumentative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of people writing. end up lawyers probably yeah. got that. So <laughs> yeah, I, I got that and it was like, you know, just that, you know, sense of fairness and wanting to fight for those things. And I think that that was probably the major turning point to where I said, okay, well, you know, I'll go into to law, but that was uh, an interesting story. And I think that, cause I, I actually, one of the, the person who actually won president, and I told him, I was like, it's not personal. I, you're a great friend of mine, but at the same time, I didn't get to vote. So I don't think that it's right that you have to be in this specific room at this specific time, and only the people who went here got to vote for this, you know, mm -hmm. what I consider to be important, because it's like, well, this person's gonna determine our class reunion, they're gonna do all of this stuff, and so I wanted to have that, so. That's always an interesting story that I think about. It sounds like it's I, still an issue. So. It is, because you know what? As I, I, I will say, and I will say, we did not have a 10-year class reunion 
because I told them that this is going to be an important thing. If you select someone who's not going to be committed to this position, we'll regret it in the future. And so, you're right. Not, not saying I told you so, but wow, <laughs> ten years, ten years old, thirteen. Okay, great, great. I, I remember when I was ten. Guess what? I wanted to be a general. Mm. I, uh, in high school, when the military came to Woodruff High School, they gave you this application. And you have to remember, that was in uh, 1961. My grades were yeah, on a scale of four, and three seven three five. They told me that well, uh, you uh, don't qualify because you got one C. Mm. My mother said, "Bullshit." Okay. So I didn't uh, go to West Point, but uh, I did it the other way. I went to the Marine Corps and came up the ranks. <laughs> Not general though, but I didn't stay long enough. Okay. <laughs> But seriously, uh, a, a lot of times uh, I was influenced by the people who were active in the community. Uh, there was a center, a, a recreational center called uh, Carver. Dr. Carver, the chemist, it was named after him. And I don't think that we recognize a lot as to what indirect or direct influence we have on, on young people. But we have it, and uh, let us just make sure that we pass it on. Gentlemen, it's been nice talking with both of you. Judge, great seeing you again. Great seeing you too. Counselor, I've seen you in the courthouse. Yes. Uh, at some point in time, matter of fact, I've seen everybody in the courthouse. <laughs> but seriously speaking, uh, Great to see you. Great to have you. And come again. Definitely. You come again too, Josh. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. We're going to play out. All right. That was great. Good morning. Today we have with us Judge Martin Hoffman of the 68th District Court in Dallas, Texas. He is here. Yes. Thank you. This is Dr. Lewis. Catch my show, The Dr. Fred Lewis Show, every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. You'll be able to hear news and views, and we want to hear from you. Log in on Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in.